Hey there, it's Paul Logan. We're going to go through blood today. Now, in the past, this has been challenging for students, so I've tried to uh, help simplify it a little bit and draw some um, conclusions for you and help you to see how uh, all this stuff works together, because it is kind of overwhelming if you don't have somebody to um, help simplify it for you. So I want to start with what I always think is interesting. Um, you know, when we think about the bone marrow and where it is that is, uh, you know, and what part of our body is producing all of these blood cells, we think of the big long bones, you know, the femur and the tibia, and those have all of the um, uh, cell production factories in there. Well, it turns out that's not really accurate for adults. It's true in kids. Almost all of the red blood cells and white blood cells and platelets uh, in children are formed in uh, the long bones. But as we get older, and once we get past 15 years or so, the majority of that um, uh Cell production happens in the spongy bone, vertebrae, the sternum, the ribs. And so I just think that's interesting to think about. Now, we know that the, <clears throat> excuse me, the blood is composed of plasma and plasma um, takes up most of that space. 91% of it is water. Uh, 7% are proteins and the most prevalent protein is albumin. The other globulins and fibrinogen and uh, the clotting factors and such are present in the uh, proteins as well, but the vast majority is albumin. Um, the other solutes then are the ions that float around, calcium ions, potassium ions, etc., uh, waste products, gases, etc. There's uh, less than 1% of all of the uh, content of the blood is composed of platelets and leukocytes. And so the white blood cells uh, are shown here, and those uh, add up to less than 1%. So the largest formed element in the blood is um, erythrocytes. Now, remember that all of these cells start from a common progenitor, right? So the stem cells, the hematopoietic, uh, hematopoietic stem cells give rise to the lymphoid progenitor and the myeloid stem cell as well. So we know that cells come from a common uh, stem cell, right? All of these formed elements in the blood come from this uh, original, what we used to call pluripotent uh, stem cell. And from there come the lymphoid cells and also the myeloid cells. And there's, all, there's also this one that sort of gets hidden in there that gives rise to the dendritic cells. But the part that we're really interested in for, uh, for this part of our discussion uh, are these, the megakaryocyte and the erythrocyte, um, but also the mast cells and the other white blood cells uh, and the plasma cells that give rise to, uh, uh, to the immune function of the blood. When we have uh, blood, red blood cell formation, the rest of that line that isn't pictured there uh, is right here. So we start with a proerythroblast from the stem cell, and then that divides into uh, basophil erythroblasts, and then it goes on down the line to the point where you'll recognize the term reticulocyte, right? This is an immature red blood cell that's just about done cooking, so to speak, and it lives um, uh, in the bone marrow until it's time to be released into the bloodstream, and then uh, it finally finishes its maturation and turns into an erythrocyte. And that's what uh, gets released into the bloodstream then, the fully formed erythrocytes.
When anemias occur, and we're going to talk about anemias shortly, there are different shapes and different colors of the, of the cells that, uh, that occur. And so in microcytic hypochromic anemia, they're small, that's microcytic, and hypochromic means they're pale, not as much color, because they don't have as much um, uh, hemoglobin. So that is one type of cell um, that is produced in anemias that's abnormal, right? There's also megaloblastic anemias, and these occur when there's a, a problem with the building blocks. So there's not B12, and there's not folate or something of that nature. We get these megaloblastic or giant cell uh, anemias. Of course, we're all familiar with sickle cell anemia, and in sickle cell crisis, um, the cells sickle instead of having that biconcave disc. Uh, and then there are other conditions uh, as well, such as erythroblastosis fatalis, um, which uh, releases these poorly formed immature cells into the general circulation. Now remember that erythropoietin is the... Um, the hormone that begins all of this process that regulates the amount of red blood cells that are produced. So the way that that works is that the kidney and some other organs, um, but mostly this occurs in the kidney, where uh, at the glomerulus there is sensed the amount of oxygen that's present in the blood. Okay. That hypoxia stimulates production of erythropoietin somewhere in the kidney. Nobody's really identified where that is, but it produces erythropoietin that gets released, and that stimulates um, the stem cells to produce to start going through the motions of producing red blood cells. And then as those red blood cells get produced, they get released into the circulation. There is um, better oxygenation. And then that has a negative feedback effect on the kidney and erythropoietin production. So this is the method that the body uses to regulate the number of red blood cells. Now, what's required for having red blood cells? Well, you know, we need iron, right? Because it's uh, all the red blood cells are made up of hemoglobin, and hemoglobin has um, iron. That is what it is. We need B12 and folate to make the cells correctly, right? So that's sort of the instruction set. They're the catalysts that um, make sure that everything is formed correctly. If they don't, if they aren't present, um, and certainly B12 deficiencies are more common today than uh, folate deficiencies are. Why is that? Well, because we started adding folate to the food supply um, in flour probably, uh, I don't know, 30 years ago or so. I remember I was in college at the time or shortly um, out of college. So... Today, we don't have as many folate deficiencies causing anemia, but B12 is still fairly common. Um, it certainly was common after gastric bypass surgery, um, but now we do sleeve gastrectomy and there's no um, uh, lack of, uh, or there's no malabsorption that happens in that operation. So we, we, we don't see it very often as a result of that anymore. So it turns out that we can't possibly absorb enough iron in our diets to keep all of our red blood cells in motion. So a lot, a significant amount of the iron that we use to make new red blood cells is recycled from RBCs that get disposed of, all right? So, you know, red blood cells live for 120 days or so. Um, when they are taken out of circulation, they're broken down and their constituent parts then get used. So when that, uh, when that process occurs, we have to pull out the iron from the uh, hemoglobin molecule in the red blood cell and then get it transferred somewhere. 
So ferritin plays a role. Hemosiderin plays a role. Um, uh, the heme molecule gets moved, uh, gets the iron removed from it from some enzymatic action. And then that iron gets transferred with transferrin. That is the um, mobile form of iron. That is the transport form of iron. And then it gets pulled into the red blood cells and uh, gets, um, gets used in the production of new red blood cells. So remember, iron is required for hemoglobin synthesis. Um, it is poorly soluble in the body fluids, and so it needs that carrier protein. And um, uh, transferrin is the carrier protein that moves iron from the gut, if it's uh, iron that's being taken from the diet, or from the spleen or bone marrow, uh, I'm sorry, from the spleen, uh, if it is being recycled from other red blood cells. And those um, sources of iron then go to the bone marrow to produce new red blood cells. So remember your total, bi uh, total body iron content is about three or four grams. But look at this, your daily um, ability to absorb iron is only one to two milligrams. So if your total iron content of your body is three to four grams, and there's only one to two milligrams that are absorbed from your diet, where's all the rest of it coming from? Well, it comes from those old dead red blood cells. And we have to have a good mechanism for processing that iron uh, to, out of those uh, dead red blood cells. Um, Transferrin is, again, the, uh, the transport form, and uh, it is about 20 to 50% bound to iron, and we can use that percent of iron binding as a tool to help us figure out uh, how well supplied the body is with iron and whether somebody needs more uh, iron. Ferritin, then, is the intracellular storage form of iron. Now, some of it is circulating in the blood, and we can measure that tiny amount um, uh, in the serum as well, and there are different levels for men and women. Now, one other byproduct of breakdown of these cells, of these red blood cells, uh, is bilirubin. And so bilirubin... Um, is taken from the uh, heme molecule, gets converted to uh, biliverdin, and then that gets converted to unconjugated bilirubin. Then it goes to the liver, and the liver conjugates it, and then bilirubin is excreted in the bile. Now, the only thing that you might be wondering is, um, what exactly is conjugation? Well, you know, in medicine, we need fancy words that um, mean something very simple. Essentially, conjugation is really just attaching that uh, insoluble product to a soluble product. And what do you think the most common way of doing that is? Uh, it's attaching it to albumin, which happens to be the most prevalent protein circulating in the blood. So the liver does that. It attaches the, um, the bilirubin molecule to the uh, albumin molecule, and that's the transport form that's easily um, uh, dissolved or... Um, uh, yeah, dissolved in uh, blood, right? So that's all that conjugated bilirubin is. There is some unconjugated bilirubin that circulates, but um, most of it is conjugated, as long as there's normal protein stores and all that stuff. So this is the dirty details, if you're interested. Um, the reticuloendothelial system, remember what that is? That's the uh, that's all the Kupfer cells and all the uh, macrophages uh, 
uh, throughout the body. Kupfer cells are in the liver and there's uh, macrophages in the lungs and all tissues in the body, including the skin, have these. And together we call them the reticuloendothelial system. And that also includes the uh, spleen uh, and the liver, etc. Okay, so those um, get those uh, senescent red blood cells, the ones that are tagged to die, and extract the heme from them through this process with heme oxygenase. That produces by uh, biliverdin, and then that results in unconjugated bilirubin. That unconjugated bilirubin has to be combined with albumin, right, or some other. Uh, protein to make it soluble in the blood and that's done in the liver okay there's um once the bilirubin is conjugated then we can start getting rid of it from the body and how do we get rid of it well we get rid of it in two different ways one is um through bile <coughs> excuse me as it goes um, through this process of bacterial activation, um, we get urobilinogen and then oxidation, oxidation happens and blah, blah, blah. It gets released into bile. And that's what uh, gives, uh, part of what gives stool its color. The other way that we get rid of um, conjugated bilirubin is to send it to the kidneys. Now the kidneys can't handle a ton of it, right? The bile is the most efficient way to get rid of it, but we can uh, get rid of some through the kidneys and uh, through ure uh, urobilinogen. All right, enough about that. So the iron cycle is demonstrated here. I'll let you work through that on your own. It's pretty simple. Um, the whole idea is to take all sources of iron, whether it's dietary or whether it's from those uh, red blood cells that are um, destroyed and then stored in the spleen or whether it's from the liver. The whole idea is to take all that iron and send it to the bone marrow. Of course, here we have a picture at a long bone, which is kind of stupid because we know that that's not where it happens, but who cares? That's fine. So then in the bone marrow is where uh, all of that iron gets put together again and um, uh, creates these erythrocytes. Okay. So let's talk about anemia. Um, remember the blood components that we talked about before? Uh, plasma makes up a lot, formed elements make up less, and uh, in total, the blood volume of the, uh, I'm sorry, the weight of the blood volume is about 7% of the body weight. Um, blood cells form about 45% of that volume, and remember the blood cells consist mostly of red blood cells. Less than 1% are platelets, and less than 1% uh, are white blood cells. So the RBCs are the most abundant uh, cells in the body. 80% of the uh, cells are red blood cells. They are small biconcave discs. Remember, they live for about 120 days. Why is that important for us to know? Well, because, you know, you want to know how the body works. But also because when it comes time to look at somebody's blood sugar control over the last three months, the reason that the number is three months is because of this. Because we want to know um, those red blood cells how much exposure do they have to glucose right in the blood and we have to keep in mind that that um, happens over a period of three months or four months so the minimum amount um, required for testing the um, average daily blood sugar uh, through that test the hemoglobin a1c is uh, three months so the hemoglobin molecule, remember, has um, alpha subunits and beta subunits. That's unimportant. The fact is that they can hold four oxygen molecules. Each of these hemoglobin molecules can hold on to four oxygens. Now, some patients develop anemia. And when they develop anemia, we need to be able to figure out what kind it is. Is it anemia because of, I don't know, 
lack of red blood cells? Is it anemia because of lack of iron? Is it anemia because they have some uh, genetic abnormality? Well, we can use the red blood cell indices on the CBC to figure that out. And the two that we use primarily uh, are the MCV, the mean corpuscular volume, and the MCHC, which is the mean corpuscular hemoglobin concentration. The MCV tells us about the size, right? The mean corpuscular volume. What is the volume of red blood cells that are in a given sample? And this is how it's um, uh, calculated. It's the hematocrit divided by the RBCs um, uh, per microliter times 10. And so that tells us about whether the anemia is microcytic or macrocytic. If the MCV is high, then it's macrocytic. If it's low, then it's microcytic, right? Easy. The color then comes from understanding the MCHC. That is the concentration of hemoglobin in the average red blood cell. And here's the formula for that. So when we're talking about um, the color of the red blood cells, the MCHC tells us whether this is a hypochromic, if the MCHC is low, or hyperchromic, if the MCHC is high, kind of anemia. So the CBC gives us a lot of information and we have to pick it apart to find out the information that we need for uh, evaluating anemias. So we always start with the hemoglobin, right? Well, if you're a medicine person, it's hemoglobin. If you're a surgical person or peds, it's hematocrit, but we're gonna use hemoglobin because that's what I know. Um, we're gonna start with that and know that we have an anemia present because the uh, hemoglobin level is low. Next, we're gonna look at the MCV and the MCHC to tell us the size of the red blood cells and the hemoglobin concentration or the color of the red blood cells. We can also do iron studies. We can measure the direct amount of iron in the blood, and then we can measure the total iron binding capacity or TIBC, and we can measure the ferritin levels as well, as well as transferrin and some other things. But these are the major ones that we look at. So let's think about what are the reasons that you can have anemia? Well, you can have blood loss, right? You can have chronic blood loss anemia, where somebody, for instance, has uh, a colon cancer, and that colon cancer leaks a tiny bit of blood, but it happens every day for a year. Well, you're eventually, because your body can't suck up all that iron from the diet, it needs to use red blood cells, but those red blood cells are being lost, so it can't keep up, and therefore you get anemic, right? That's the scenario. And so we can see chronic GI bleeding um, producing anemia, uh, and that's one of our diagnostic tests for colon cancer. Now there's other ways that we can lose blood too, right? You can have an acute GI bleed, you can have trauma, you can have blood loss during surgery. Uh, women have blood loss during menstruation. Um, there's lots of different reasons for blood loss. So once we find that somebody has blood loss anemia, right, or anemia, then we have to look and see what kind of uh, uh, blood loss anemia they have perhaps. Now you can also have faulty RBC production. So that happens if you don't have all the right building blocks. Well, what are the building blocks? One of them is iron, right? So as we alluded to, if you have a colon cancer and it's leaking a little bit of blood in your stool every day, not enough to see with the naked eye, but every single day you're losing more and more red blood cells that can't be recycled into the components that are needed principally iron, to make new red blood cells, then you develop this iron deficient anemia, okay? Um, you can have bone marrow or stem cell problems. We have this problem with aplastic anemia, lead poisoning, thalassemia, uh, different uh, other reasons for um, 
uh, stem cell problems. We can have vitamin deficiency anemia, like B12 deficiency or folate deficiency. We can have sickle cell anemia. We can have anemia of chronic disease, where there's just this chronic disease that's present uh, uh, that prevents a correct amount of erythropoietin production, etc. And then there's something called hemolytic anemias. And so these can be immunologic, right? One of the recurring themes in pathophysiology that we talked about the first week. Um, if your body is attacking your own red blood cells, then that's a problem. Uh, it may be that there are toxins that you're exposed to, uh, whether it's occupational exposure or, uh, or something else, can be genetic causes. And of course, anything that's in the blood that's um, uh, metal can certainly produce hemolytic anemias. So in the old days, when, um, when we were making uh, or learning to make... Um, cardiac valves, we had the ball and cage valves, um, they chewed up a lot of platelets and a lot of uh, red blood cells. So some of those cardiac devices, uh, also um, balloon pumps can do it uh, in the ICU. Um, the older versions of the uh, assist devices and things like that. So lots of cardiac devices can chew up all of the red blood cells and produce that hemolytic anemia. So the most common of these is really iron deficient anemia, uh, at least in the general sense of the general population. And that uh, is recognized because it's uh, microcytic and hypochromic anemia. So they're small and pale red blood cells. The transferrin is increased because the body's trying to keep up, right? It's taking all of the iron that it can and sending it to the bone marrow. That means the uh, transferrin levels are going to be high. Even though there's iron deficiency, it's trying its best to move all the iron that it can, and that's why the transferrin levels can be high. The transferrin saturation, though, is low. It's not, it doesn't have enough iron attached to it, and so that value is low, so is the ferritin level, because remember, ferritin is the storage form of iron that gets stored in the liver and in the muscle cells. Anemia of chronic disease is really a diagnosis of exclusion. Um, it may be associated with iron deficiency as well, um, but, you know, uh, renal, renally induced anemia uh, and other anemias of chronic disease, we make that diagnosis after we figure out that it's, you know, that it's not any of these other forms. Hemolytic anemia has a very characteristic look under the microscope. Um, we have these uh, irregularly shaped jagged cells that can happen, um, and these are called uh, schistocytes. And uh, these are the schistocytes. And then these are um, helmet cells, I think. Um, those are also um, uh, characteristic of um, hemolytic anemias. Okay? So what I really want you to be able to do is to look at a CBC, determine that there's anemia. We can all do that, right? That's easy. But identify iron deficient anemia um, based on the fact that it's microcytic and hypochromic, right? So I want you to be able to have that skill. Um, and so prepare that way uh, as you um, prepare for the quiz. So let's talk about hemostasis. Now, at a general level, the way the body heals itself is there's some problem that happens with the vessel. It gets sliced somehow. You get stabbed or whatever. You get a shank in uh, prison, whatever. Um, that vessel gets severed and the blood leaks out, right? So what's the first thing that happens to stop that? Well, the platelets come together and they stick and they form this white clot. 
over top of white clot then comes the fibrin. And the fibrin is this protein that gets laid down on top of those platelets and it traps some red blood cells inside and eventually enough schmutz gets stuck together between the fibrin, the platelets and the red blood cells and some white blood cells that get stuck in there too that the clot forms. And that fibrin clot is what prevents the body from bleeding to death. Pretty ingenious, right? Um, so after a period of time, after the body can heal itself and put the vessel back together and all that, then clot retraction has to occur. And now the body can remove that clot and allow restoration of blood flow. That's the process. Well, the platelets are the first part that start that. And remember that the platelets um, start by adhering to the vessel wall through release of von Willebrand factor, okay? So the endothelial cells here um, can produce von Willebrand factor, and that von Willebrand factor uh, pulls in platelets, makes them stick uh, to the vessel wall, and makes them stick to other platelets, all right? There's also this um, the presence of these G-protein coupled receptors, um, and those specifically are the things that um, adhere to the ADP uh, molecule on the, uh, or the ADP receptor on the platelet, and the thromboxane A2 receptor on the platelet, and to thrombin as well. Now, if you remember back in pharmacology class, you probably learned that, uh, that there are uh, ADP receptors that we can target with um, uh, Plavix, for instance. Thromboxane A2 receptors are targeted by aspirin. And so we have the ability to interfere with this platelet aggregation uh, through different uh, areas. Thrombin we can mess with with, uh, uh, with some of the... Um, uh, some of the fancy cath lab drugs uh, like Reapro and uh, Integralin and things like that, the glyco two, uh, glycoprotein 2B3A uh, inhibitors um, that, that hit the GP2B3A receptor. So that's the process when there is um, blood injury to the uh, or an injury to the blood tissue. That's the intrinsic uh, mechanism. The extrinsic happens with vascular trauma. So when there's some vessel interruption from a knife or something like that, trauma, um, tissue factor gets released that produces um, or, or that stimulates um, these platelets to stick together. And then fibrin comes and the, uh, gets laid down and the rest of the clot forms. Okay, that's just the, um, the full picture of uh, hemostasis after vascular trauma. Remember that the platelet surface is really a scaffold. There are multiple receptors on those platelets uh, to which different substances can uh, adhere. And that means that the platelets can be involved in uh, just sticking to one another, but also sticking to thrombin as well, and in turn, fibrin. So remember the arachidonic acid products, um, those can be uh, influenced by aspirin. They are one of the ways that um, uh, platelets stick together, and we can mess with that by giving aspirin. Um, so there's a little summary for you, but that is the platelet stuff. Platelets have a huge role in vascular um, uh, events like heart attacks, strokes, um, vascular disease. Those kind of things are um, primarily platelet driven events. And that's why we give antiplatelet drugs to prevent strokes, to prevent heart attacks, etc. Now, we also need to talk about, in addition to the antiplatelet stuff, or the platelet contrib uh, contributors to clotting, we need to talk about the protein 
contributors to clotting too. And remember, there's an extrinsic pathway and an intrinsic pathway. The extrinsic pathway starts with tissue trauma, uh, that is damage to the vessel itself from getting stabbed, for instance, and the vessel breaks open and now tissue factor gets released that stimulates production of, or stimulates the uh, activity of factor seven. It gets activated. That's what seven A is. That's um, factor seven plus tissue factor becomes uh, activated factor seven. And then calcium gets involved and produces along with tissue factor and factor 7a uh, produces activated factor 10 or 10a that is the part that um, we're interested in we're interested in this factor 10 because that is the last step before this final common pathway that is um, common to both the extrinsic and intrinsic pathways the activation of prothrombin, okay? So all of that stuff I told you here is nice to know. We need to understand that calcium is involved here and that there's these active um, clotting proteins that get activated with calcium. That's really what you need to know. The next thing you need to know is that the final common pathway starts with activation of prothrombin, all right? The intrinsic pathway is where there's some blood trauma that happens. There's some tissue injury to the blood itself, and the blood then starts um, activating the clotting cascade, okay? And so um, once that blood trauma occurs, it begins with factor 12, and goes through this whole process. Again, calcium plays a major role. We get down to the platelet level and then thrombin gets involved and guess what happens here? Now we're back down to the common active pathway of prothrombin mixing with all the other things uh, plus calcium to make thrombin. So this is really what you need to know. It's nice to know the extrinsic pathway. It's nice to know the intrinsic pathway. But at the end of the day, coagulation happens in this final common pathway where prothrombin um, gets, uh, I'm sorry, prothrombin enters and um, gets activated by calcium to produce thrombin. Then fibrinogen gets turned into fibrin monomers, and those fibrin monomers get laid down in the clot um, uh, when calcium is present. And those fibrin fibers um, pull in more platelets and more red blood cells, and that cross-linking of the fibrin fibers is what makes the blood clot. Okay? That's how it works. That's how it works. If we want to measure the intrinsic clotting capacity, we measure the prothrombin time or the PT, all right? This is the one that we measure for warfarin because warfarin uses uh, or activates the, uh, de deactivates the, um, the intrinsic pathway, okay? The extrinsic pathway we measure by uh, looking at the PTT measurement, okay? That's the extrinsic portion that, um, that we're interested in looking at here. Now, if there weren't checks and balances in place, the clot formation would go uncontrolled, right? Well, that is what we see in conditions such as uh, DIC, disseminated intravascular coagulation, is where the whole body freaks out and it goes way overboard in forming clot everywhere. That's bad. Well, why does that happen? It happens because there's no restraint of the clotting mechanism. So these are the restraint strategies that are used by the body. Primarily, well, 
I should say, a very important part of that is healthy endothelium. When healthy endothelium is present, then those molecules that it produces will keep the platelets in check and keep the clotting cascade in check. Okay, so they're constant battle back and forth to maintain homeostasis. The other thing that happens is that plasmin then starts the clot lysis once the tissue has healed. And so the propagation of the clot does not continue. As the body heals, plasmin starts pulling everything apart. And that's uh, again, this struggle that's always going on to maintain homeostasis. The tissue factor pathway um, blocks extrinsic pathway activity. So that's good, right? We always want the intrinsic and extrinsic to be um, uh, against each other to some extent so that there's a check and balance system. The proteases are inactivated by antithrombin. The clotting cascade cofactors uh, are inhibited by the protein C and protein S uh, system. That's why when there's protein C and S deficiency, it's a hypercoagulable state, right? All right, so way more information than you need to know. I just want you to have an appreciation for the fact that uh, while the body's trying to clot, there are complementary components that are trying to prevent clot and dissolve clot in an effort to make sure that once you start clotting, your body doesn't just clot entirely. Okay? Remember, don't forget this part about the healthy endothelium. It's so important. So important. And that's why ACE inhibitors work. Because ACE inhibitors promote nitric oxide and prostacyclins and uh, all the rest of this. They promote healthy endothelial function and that reduces risk of MI and risk of stroke. Now, we said that once the clot is formed, the body needs to get rid of it, right? Well, this is how it works. Plasminogen, and you can remember that because tissue plasminogen activator or TPA or urokinase, um, those plasminogen activators start the unclotting process. Um, that produces plasmin and the fibrin clot gets um, uh, undone and then uh, the fibrin degradation products or fibrin split products are produced, which can be measured. Uh, in the blood as well. More information about uh, limiting the coagulation cascade activity, uh, just a little more detail. So let me explain this term Virchow's triad to you. Virchow's triad are three conditions that can result in clot formation. They don't occur together obviously, because there's no endothelial surface in the veins, right? The, um, the three components are endothelium and endothelial injury. That can produce uh, clot formation. Venous stasis can produce clot formation as well. And that happens because when, when blood just sits around and doesn't have anything to do, like teenagers, it gets into trouble, right? And it gets into trouble because it hangs out too much and they uh, and the clotting cascade can begin. So venous stasis is a second way that clot can form. And then the third way is a hypercoagulable state. And so this hypercoagulability is uh, a potential cause of uh, clotting disorders as well. So that's how uh, that's how pathological um, clotting can occur, either because there's some uh, unhealthy endothelial lining, such as we see in vascular disease, hypertension, diabetes, dyslipidemia, all that stuff together. Or there's venous stasis where um, blood has a tough time getting back to the heart, stuck in the legs, uh, and those clots can form there, DVT. And then there's hypercoagulability, where um, there are some uh, protein CNS deficiency or 
Factor V Leiden or any number of these other um, uh, reasons that um, that somebody is in a hypercoagulable state. Okay, another reason for a hypercoagulable state can be surgery. Right, your body is in the mood to clot after it's been injured in surgery, and so that sort of makes clot um, potentiate. Uh, throughout the rest of the body because of that hypercoagulability. Now, there are thrombo thromboembolic um, sites elsewhere, right? So I just wanted to point out to you, we know about the um, uh, arteries that are prone to endoth endothelial injury. We just talked about that. You know about large veins that have... Uh, uh, an increased susceptibility to blood clot formation. But why does atrial fibrillation cause uh, potential for uh, arterial embolization? This is the only arterial embolizing um, uh, thing that can happen, right? DVT doesn't break off and go to the brain, right? That can't happen. If DVT breaks off, it goes to the lungs. Now, I said it can't happen, but actually there is a condition where it can happen. Uh, and Teddy Bruschi, famous football player on um, the New England Patriots, whatever it was, 10 years ago, might have been 20 years ago for all I know. Um, that condition that he had was an ASD, right? So he had a patent foramen of alley or... Uh, some other hole in his heart that allowed the blood clot from his leg to travel up to his heart at just the wrong instance he inhaled, changed the um, blood flow from uh, into the right atrium into the left atrium, right? And then it, that clot ends up on the left side of the heart. And now it goes to your brain and gives you a stroke. So, we say that there's no way for a venous clot to go to your brain, but there is. And it's all bad. It's a terrible situation um, where everything has to go wrong at the exact right moment uh, in order for that blood clot to cross over to the left side of the heart and go to your brain. Apart from that, the only other reason that you can have... Um, arterial embolization is from uh, blood stuck in the heart somewhere. So we see blood clot in the left apex, uh, left ventricular apex after a big heart attack, after a big anterior MI that can happen. Uh, but more commonly in atrial fibrillation, we can see this thing here. This is what I call God's little mistake, right? This is uh, the left atrial appendage and this hangs off over the side of the left ventricle from the atrium and the blood from the left atrium can um, uh, can fall down into there and when the heart isn't contracting normally when the atria aren't contracting that blood can just sit there and pool and when it pools it gets into trouble just like teenagers and the clot can form then if the patient goes back into sinus rhythm or they don't even have to go back into sinus rhythm that clot can break off and travel downstream well what's downstream from the left ventricle the brain that's one of the things and so that's what uh, causes stroke in uh, atrial fibrillation intravascular clot formation can happen uh, again remember this is uh either arterial or venous. Now, it's arterial um, when uh, an atherosclerotic plaque ruptures and that schmutz from inside the plaque goes into the uh, lumen of the vessel and stimulates blood clot, okay? That's the way that an arterial clot can happen. Um, venous thrombi develop from stasis, right? So you have uh, too much blood sitting around in the lower extremities. It doesn't get back to the heart. It clots and, uh, and then that um, propagates more clot. It breaks off, goes to the lungs, gives you pulmonary embolism. There are numerous hypercoagulable states. One that you'll hear of pretty commonly uh, 
it's one of the more popular kinds, uh, is factor V Leiden. And this is a genetic uh, abnormality where there's a uh, missense mutation where the uh, genetic code miscodes the proteins and um, that results in this factor V Leiden. This increases the risk of venous thromboembolism. And then if you throw in the additional problem of uh, a woman who smokes, for instance, uh, that can really put you uh, at, the, at the higher end. And then you throw in oral birth control, now you're really in trouble, right? And so this is the uh, this is the situation that um, that such people find themselves in uh, to get the diagnosis of a hypercoagulable state. There's also autoimmune disorders like antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. Um, there are uh, thrombocytopenias. Remember when the platelet count is low, that decreases the ability of the blood to clot because you don't have the stuff to start forming the clot. We said the platelet aggregation is the first step, right? The other thing is von Willebrand's disease where there's um, a deficit or a defect in the adherence of platelets to the uh, vascular wall. And, uh, and so that von Willebrand factor is not present in sufficient quantities or it doesn't work or whatever the issue is. Um, that prevents platelet adhesion. And then there's coagulation factors that uh, can be to blame, hemophilia A and B, uh, liver disease. Remember, the liver has like nine jobs, right? It participates in um, uh, digestion. It uh, produces... Uh, clotting factors, it does all sorts of other things. Well, the clotting factor part is a big deal. And so when somebody has liver failure, the liver can't produce enough uh, clotting factors. And so how do we know that? Well, we monitor liver failure patients, we monitor their pro time. And that tells us um, what is really the degree of um, disease that is present. The worse the disease, the worse the production of clotting factors, and therefore the higher the pro time is. Okay. Um, so there are platelet disorders. Sometimes platelets uh, get um, uh, aren't produced enough in the bone marrow. So if the bone marrow fails, like in aplastic anemia uh, or in chemotherapy, uh, we'll have low platelet counts. We may see that platelets get stuck in the spleen. Um, in liver failure with portal hypertension, uh, the platelets have a hard time moving around because of that uh, high pressure in the portal venous system. There may be some autoimmune kind of diseases that um, increase platelet destruction. When we see uh, thrombocytopenia uh, clinically, we look for uh, evidence of, uh, of it. And I should have put a picture in here of petechiae and purpura. So remember, petechiae are the little tiny vascular changes that happen. It's sort of purplish discoloration and little dots on the skin. Purpura is a bigger collection of those. It's just a bigger area that uh, takes that that uh, that that abnormality occurs at. Ecchymosis, of course. So you know, frank bleeding under the skin, um, bruising, etc. We can see excessive bleeding, particularly in the nose, in the gums, uh, and in the uh, uterine wall. There's immune thrombocytopenia, uh, and uh, as we discussed, and then there's also heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. So heparin-induced thrombocytopenia is where the heparin molecule um, reacts with the body and an immune response gets started. And from that immune response comes destruction of platelets. And as soon as we stop heparin, that goes away. And then we have to use some other uh, anticoagulant, some um, 
uh, direct thrombin inhibitor or something like that. Uh, von Willebrand's disease, there's several different mechanisms, but um, type 1 is present in most cases, and that's an autosomal dominant uh, condition. The um, effect is that there are decreased von Willebrand factor levels, and remember, von Willebrand's factor uh, adheres to platelets. And so when the endothelium gets damaged, um, there's not a release of von Willebrand factor in sufficient levels to get platelets to come to the rescue. That's really what it comes down to. Hemophilia, there's hemophilia A and B. Um, I'll let you read about that on your own. I am probably not the best person to uh, explain that to you. And again, just um, the, the major take home of this slide is to remember that um, bleeding disorders that we see in liver disease are a result of the fact that the liver isn't producing enough um, clotting factors. Another reason for it could be vitamin K malabsorption, right? When you have portal hypertension, that puts pressure uh, and prevents the absorption of vitamin K in sufficient quantities, uh, and so that can be uh, an issue as well.